pong paksa ngayon is so challenging and it's all about developing healthy pastors. I used to say that ano ang similarity ng pulis at saka pastor? <coughs> huh? What is the similarity of a policeman and a pastor? Yeah, no, they have all bulging stomach. <laughs> But, uh, the, 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 the policeman in the Philippines, lumalaki ang chan because ng kotong bribery. And the pastor because of visitation. <laughs> Now, It may appear a joke that, but many pastors are indeed, you know, suffering from physical health, and they need to really improve yung kanilang health, physical health, because we cannot do the ministry without that. But tonight, I'm moving beyond the physical health ng ating uh, ating mga kalusugan. What we want to talk about about the health of our spiritual life, so that we can do an effective ministry. Now this is very important because nowadays we realize the importance of developing a healthy church so that we can really become missional and really become salt and light in this society. But I'm in frustrations in relation to what we see around even in this country. But it is also very frustrating to see when the church that is supposed to be a witness is not doing its part. And ultimately, we have to trace The, the lack of that credibility because of the pastors who are not able to provide developing a healthy church. Way back in 2010 in Lausanne, uh, in Cape Town, there was this very challenging uh, and indicting message given by Chris Wright who said that the main stumbling block today hindering others to know Jesus Christ is not the persecution of the church. But the problem today is that the church has lost its witness. The church has lost the integrity of Christian leaders. And he continued to say that these leaders are seduced to worship the idols of power, success, and greed. Now, even before that, even in Lausanne, uh, 20, uh, 1974, the state of the church has been uh, confronted because of The church being seduced to materialism, seduced to consumerism, seduced to worldly power. And in recent times, we have seen that this issue ay nasa kamay na ng ating mga kapastoran. And so we need to really uh, start looking in our training, the developing of the health of the pastors so that we can develop healthy and holy people capable of giving witness into the world. Now, I'm sure you are aware that in recent times, many of our colleagues who are, whom we look up to because they are superstars that have become falling stars. Medyo, it sadden us. And uh, we know that we are not exempted from temptation. And therefore, we need to continually evaluate ourselves because if we lose our integrity, If we don't have that credibility, there is no witness. And the state of the church would actually depend on us and the fellow pastors that we're going to train along the road. Now, many years back when John Stott was still alive, he said that the church today is one kilometer wide and an inch thick. So the church today is highly informed with the many seminars that are happening all over the world and we are investing so much money for this kind of training and yet the church that knows so many things about God, about theology, about the Bible, not only the pastors, the pastors don't have the monopoly of knowledge today. Mind you, some of our members are even brighter to us when it comes to their faith because they have access to knowledge. But Knowing so much about the Bible, knowing so much about God does not guarantee that we really know God in a very intimate way. When I was a student uh, yeah, and a young staff of university, the book that came out though, at that time in the 70s, James Parker wrote the book and it has become a classic called Knowing God. How many of you have read that book? If you have not, Read it. It's now a classic. 
And there's one thing there that he said that I have not forgotten even until now. He said to know God is, to know, is not to know about God, but to know Him by experience. And yet, you know, experience and knowledge is something that we contest in theology. And our seminarians, our professors are a bit skeptical when we talk of experiential knowledge of God. It tends to be subjective. But there is no credibility if we really do, don't know God by experience. And so it's very important that we begin to examine ourselves. And I hope that our reflection this, this evening will help us to evaluate the way we train our pastors. Now, we know that some of you have already uh, been familiar of the revealed survey that have come out many years ago. This was published in Christianity Today. And the revealed survey has studied and researched the state of some of the mega churches. And one of those mega churches that was studied is the Willow Creek community in Chicago. And you know, in these mega churches, is this a state of the art church? And they have many programs with the intention of really developing their members to grow like Christ. But it was disappointing that if it is in the scale one to five, those who have gone into the training and those who have sat to listen to God preaching did not move the middle. They were just comfortable and convenient attending Bible study, but not willing to be radical enough to be committed in following Jesus Christ. When Bill Hybels was here, I asked the same question. I said, what intervention are you doing to respond to this revelation that, you had, that was done? And he said, well, we will do more preaching on doctrine. And yet in his story, he was talking about godly men who have journeyed with him and really crossed the line and moved to us, really committed to the Lord Jesus Christ. And I saw how he was mentoring them. And yet, it was not part of the intervention that they want to do. They still want to proclaim from the pulpit. And so we need to continually uh, examine that. That doesn't guarantee that our churches are growing in attendance through programs that we have maturing disciples of Jesus Christ. We know that we can only multiply our own kind. And to disciple others, we need real disciples. Now, of course, <clears throat> this is a very dangerous topic, and it makes me humble when we talk about who is a healthy pastoral leader. Now, you can make many definitions. It's simply that we are becoming Christ-like. The bottom line is we become Christ-like. We don't need much explanation. It is being transformed and being conformed in the image of Jesus Christ. But it doesn't guarantee that people are being informed about Christianity, that they are being formed in Christ's likeness so that they are transformed people that will make a difference in this world. And these are the disturbing questions today. We need pastoral leaders. So in topic, we are talking about pastoral leaders. Because we have seen that in whenever we have conferences, we have training, many of those who are attending are not officially the pastor of the church. They don't have the position and the title of the reverend, of the bishop, of the super reverend. They're just ordinary leaders, but they're the ones really pastoring in the church. And they want to attend, so we call them the pastoral leaders. And many of the pastoral leaders, both the lay people and the pastors, the real issue is really they don't have a healthy self-concept of who they are. Marami sa atin insecure. So kailangan natin na magbigay ng pogi points or we add other names to us, attached to our name just to build up our image. And I'll talk more about this, but this is a very important concept because in order that we can be accepted, we are seduced to the climate of success where we have to compete and compare and exercise control so that when we can reach our goal. And that is a problem. And so if there is to be a healthy self-concept of who we are, not defined by our performance, 
not defined by what people say to us. We need inner healing, and we know already this. So, much stud so many studies have been done about damaged emotion, and they manifest. So at a given time, Pastor Rolly, see, Rolly said, I have seen many dysfunctional pastors pastoring dysfunctional churches. And the root issue is that inner hurt that remain unresolved. And you know what happened when we have not resolved that insecurity in our lives, that feeling of rejection, then we become leaders. We are given the power and authority. It is dangerous to give power to a leader that is insecure. Imagine Saul. So he kept hunting David. And my, how many senior pastors who are acting like Saul? Because they are insecure. And they could not accept. They have been in the ministry for 50 years and they don't want to step down. And they want to control. So there is no difference between the dynasty that we see in politics and the kind of dynasty we see in ministry. So we're talking about holiness. We're talking about wholeness of integrated person in thinking, in feeling, in acting, in the totality of life. That we can really look at ourselves without comparing with others. We are so secure of who we are simply because God loves us. But we are still locked, not in holistic perception, but we are still locked in dualistic perspective. We still divide the sacred and the secular, and it manifests in our studies. And therefore... It is more important to succeed in ministering a church than to minister to our own family. Why? It's more sacred to be in Bible study than to be with our family. And sadly, this is also the expectation of our church members. And we have to please them if we, are, if we want to keep our job. And the one that we sacrifice are the people we love so much. So growing a healthy pastor is about transformation, and we know that this is a slow process. We know that, isn't it? We cannot transform people overnight, do we? Ay, tagal nga natin, di pa tayo natatransform. Tayo pa lang, ano? <laughs> Hirap pa rin tayo. May mga rami pa rin tayong mga issues. And I realized there are issues in my life which I thought I have resolved. Now at my age that I'm reaching 70, it's coming up again. Meron ba kayong ganong experience? Pastor Velasquez, meron ba tayong karanasan ganon? Akala natin, na-resolve na natin. Ngayon, lumalabas pa uli, ano? Akala natin, di na tayo naiingit. Naiingit pa rin pala tayo. And so, transformation is not an easy process. And therefore, we, had, we need to really think and in, in integrate this important aspect in our training in developing healthy pastors because we can have pastors who are brilliant but bossy. You know what I've seen in our development? People, pastors who become brilliant, they become too busy teaching and preaching and they develop big churches and when they're up there, they become the boss and they're bossy and that's the problem today. And so we need to really have a second look about the challenges of these challenges that we see today in pastoral training. Now all of us, our assumption and my assumption is that all of us here are engaged in some form of a training, right? Marrying, you are not involved in an organization, you are, but you are somehow training in the church, or some of you may have come from the corporate world and you have been involved there in training. Now, when we train, we have some materials, we have some curriculum, whatever. And if we look at our curriculum, what is the emphasis of our training? Of course, we know, and we don't need to talk about this and discuss about this, we will all agree that if there is to be a healthy training, we need to give to train pastor and give them the proper knowledge of theology, right? And Bible. 
And when you go to seminary, the bulk of the subject is all about the Bible and theology. Count all the subjects. And in fact, the more practical at more devotional, lower ang, mas lower ang category niyan sa seminary. So if you are in the practical side, you are not a good seminary student. This is secondary. So our emphasis has been head, so much knowledge. And this is the product of enlightenment. We must bear in mind that as a movement, Protestant has emerged from that period of time of enlightenment. And what is enlightenment? The age of reason. And so the flowering of university from the monastery training of pastors in Europe had been transferred into university. The emphasis is philosophy. So you have read all those th thick books in systematic theology. Now they are important. I'm not saying they are not important. The problem is we put most of our eggs in that basket. That's the problem. Because we know that that is not enough. It's not enough that you can have a good pa pastor here. And, you know, when I'm beginning in ministry, the most important, the center, again, what we inherited from Reformation, is that it, the center of the pulpit, the center of the stage is the Bible, an open Bible. So in the big churches, you see this big Bible, an open Bible, an open book. Now, that's a very important. Sola Scriptura. That is very important. But I realize that you can be a good pastor, a good preacher, but that doesn't mean to say that the church is becoming healthy. Do you agree or disagree? Now, many seminary professors and many Christian leaders would not agree because the heart of ministry is to preach. But who is the most problematic people in our church? The young believer who does not hear, who do not hear, have not heard our preaching, or the old believers who have heard all our preaching. The old believers. Now I think part of the problem is that we have not engaged them to process. And so, if we want really to ensure that this proclamation of the knowledge, the teaching of the knowledge we must review our way of preaching and way of teaching. It's not enough that we download it from the pulpit. It must be processed in the pew where people can ask the hard questions and make sure that the rubber hits the road. At yun po ay, kaya lang haba ng preaching natin, ano? So gusto nang umuhin ng mga members, we are still preaching. And they have forgotten all that we have preached. And so when they start to talk, they could only remember our stories. So we need to understand that this model that comes from enlightenment still dominate the way we train people. And so what happens, especially for us who have from, come from the formal theological training, sempre pag pumasok ka sa Bible school, Bible college, seminary, you are in a classroom setting. Right? And we do the training in the church for our people like, like in seminary. They are in the classroom. We have Sunday school and everything. And uh, so, ang problema, when we are, when we were in the seminary, we are even finding it difficult to read all the assignments. Do we expect our people who are uh, and then, uh, you know, tricycle driver and jeepney drivers. And when they reach home, they don't have the energy to read the assignment. They will only watch Pacquiao in the basketball. And that's all. So there must be another way to train. It doesn't mean to say that if people are not engaged in so much reading that they will not read, learn. Because Jesus Christ did not train his disciples by many 1,000 pages of reading assignments. Now, they are important. We need scholars in the church. Don't get me wrong. But for most of us who are engaged in the day-to-day -day developing our churches, we need to train our pastors who are not above intellectual capacity, but really engaged with the people in their day-to-day -day life. That's where we're going to that's where we're going to explain the gospel 
in our training so that our training will really be rooted in the development of people. Another thing that have changed in the situation today is we look at churches as an organization. So one of the problems I, I, I realized that need to be worked out in theology is ecclesiology. We are pastors and we are developing churches. But what kind of church? I must say and I'm afraid that most of us, all of us perhaps, are actually developing churches which reflect corporate structure. Corporation. Kaya ngayon, we have to change the title of the pastor, no longer CEO, uh, no longer pastor, but CEO, Chief Executive Officer. And our leaders in the church, na inget sila dun sa lumalaking churches, and therefore, they expect that we develop so many programs and we kill all the people to attend. No? Kaya yung mga husband ng mga wives, nagagalit. Because they stay in the church the whole day, hindi pa nagluluto. And so we need to think of this, that the church is not a corporation, but rather a community, a family. And you know, in the church, we need to engage more in conversations, talking about life, the significance about what we are hearing from the sermon, what's the meaning of the message today once I return to work. And the place to engage them is in conversation. Not in the classroom. Because when we were studying in the classroom, we don't want to ask the question. So when the teacher says, is there any question? And we all hide our heads. We don't want to be seen. We have that baggage. But when there is just conversation, asking questions is so natural. And the questions that we ask are the questions that really we, that we struggle with in a day-to-day -day living. And this should become part of training our pastors that they should be really trained to respond to this issue so that we are developing people, developing our churches as healthy ones. But there is a pressure. We want to hurry up training. No, we are presenting how many thousands? We scale it down. Used to be 10,000. 5,000 along here? 5,000 along. So at least nagising gising kami. May hirap pala yung 10,000. 5,000 lang ang kaya. Pero malapit na yun. No? May hirap nang matapos yan. And so, <coughs> I have read the newsletter of Al. And you, Al, you mentioned there that every day, 187,000 people come to Christ. Wow. Every day, 187,000 are becoming believers of Jesus Christ. Wow. But Al also said that every day there is a need to train 18,700 pastors. How can we cope with that? That is the great need just to cope with this overwhelming number of people and many of them are coming from the Muslim world. So how can we train them? How can we catch there is this increasing number of believers, but there is a shortfall of pastors who need to respond to them. And so we are tempted to speed up our training using internet and so on. Or sometimes we are pressured na para ma-recognize time pastor, we will just buy the certificate. Or we will invest 5,000 to have a degree. So sad, but it's happening. But it's a part of the pressure. So we speed it up and we shortcut the process because of the great need. So yun nga, marami nagsisell na lang ng degrees. And another pressure that we are seeing today is this whole matter of success that is defined in terms of numbers. And this is very important. You know, to be able to have this kind of training, muntik nang mahimatay si Hili, because I have been following how much money have come in and said nothing. And he said that we need at least half a million or 400,000 plus. How much have come in? Nothing. And so, kinakabahan na si Hill, no? Di niya alam kung saan nakabili na kayo ng mga ticket. Yung iba sa inyo, pauwiin ba kayo? So, you cannot go to hell. <laughs> 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 
But praise the Lord, <laughs> some money came in. It's not the amount, the targeted amount, but it's almost there. We praise the Lord. But, you know, that is the pressure that we have today. Training is not for free. Although free and registration, somebody paid for it. We cannot get out from this place, CDC, without paying Joe below. Nag-hire na nga siya ng security guard to be sure that we will pay this. It's, it's very expensive. But the good news is that there are so many people who would like to invest on training. But the catch is this. If we can show that we are successful. And the only, and the only definition of success that they understand is that numbers. Numbers. And numbers that scale. Numbers that scale but no substance because we hurry it up. I remember no, a famous <coughs> leadership developer came here, I don't know how many years, and he promised that he will actually mentor one million leaders. I'm sure some of you remember using this multiplying technique 2525. Did he reach that? There was no report. I have never heard. I only heard about one million leaders that he will mentor. But it did not. But it was so attractive. He was able to generate the money. Because one million leaders, wow, in a given period of time, wow, attractive. And so it is difficult to find the kind of money if we are going to be serious in developing healthy leaders. Now we are all convinced, I'm sure we don't need to debate it, and we know this by heart, that the best leadership developer is who? Who is the best leadership developer? Jesus Christ, of course. He has proven it. He turned the world upside down by concentrating on the 12 people Ang isa hudas pa, you know. But these twelve people who were so committed and they gave their lives and they move around and really, literally at that period of time, they were able to disciple the nations. The great commission given to them. And he invested how many years? Three years. We want to lower it down. We don't want no. Siguro kung aaten kayo sa training ng topic for three years, you will not make it. But Jesus Christ had to spend. Now he started ministering to the crowd and so, so many people, thousands of people came to him. But later on, he shifted and concentrated on training of the twelve. And he used parables. He used stories that theologians and scholars keep in studying and so on, and they debate. But he was just using stories and parables. Parables and stories that come from the kitchen. Parables that have come from the farming activity and so on and so forth. So simple, easy to understand. But there are many nuances in the parables. Yet the ordinary people, when they listen to the parables of Jesus, the leaders, especially the religious leaders, knew that they were referred to. So Jesus was communicating powerfully. And, and Jesus was able really to give them a perspective of the kingdom of God such a way that they really grow. It did not happen overnight. Even when Jesus Christ went to heaven, the perspective of the kingdom was not yet right. They were still talking about the kingdom of God coming to Israel. They were still very nationalistic. But the Holy Spirit came and it changed the whole scenario. Now we have the Holy Spirit. Do we? Yes, we have the Holy Spirit. But unless you are a Pentecostal, the Holy Spirit is not emphasized so much. So you need to become Bapticostal to have a balanced view. You know, there's some denominations and some groups who do not believe 
that the Holy Spirit can really manifest all His giftings today. You know, this morning we have some conversation. Now we say, you know, <coughs> Kibuloy. You know, you know, si Kibuloy? Who is from the people in Davao? <coughs> you know, sometimes Kibuloy is more biblical in the way he trained his people. Because when I was, uh, maybe about almost 20 years ago, I would be encountering the people from Dabao and these young people, and some of them are professionals, they are selling candies. And they followed Kibuloy. So I interviewed some of them. And it's a commitment, especially during Christmas, they will have a Christmas gift based on the selling. They must sell. They must not buy it. Some of them can buy it, but they must experience selling it to demonstrate their commitment and their passion. And they were trained. Well, we criticized them, but Kibuloy was successful in training. Simple. Now, there are young preachers who would come papasok sa bus and they will start to preach. And we start to criticize them. And I'll be one of them that criticize them. But I realize I cannot do it. Can you go up to the bus? Can you get up in the bus and start preaching and challenge all the people? It's very difficult. And yet they were trained to become preachers and this group will be growing. Kaya lang, instead, ang, ang na-influence nila yung mga beg, yung mga galing sa presuhan, yung mga kwan, pabalik din sa labas, meron din silang testimony, may story din sila, and they will have their offering. Kasi may offering yung sa bus, di ba? So, we, these are simple, sometimes sabihin natin, not so sophisticated, and yet they are being trained. And so, when Jesus Christ called the disciples and started to train them, He chose them. He identified and many of them are not the perfect choice. And people who have studied the disciples, they said the real candidate that will pass in the HR interview would be Judas. Yes, he's the brightest of them all. But Peter, Andrew, John, and James, they were fishermen. Simon the Zealot was just up on the mountain and so on. They were just ordinary people that we encounter every day. But he chose them to be with him, to have communion with him in prayer. So prayer is a basic training that Jesus Christ imparted. And he formed them into community, 12 disciples. And part of their training is they keep on quarreling as to who will be the greatest when the kingdom comes. So okay lang, komisano, our dysfunctionalities will come out. But I would remember when I was a young, <coughs> a young Christian. So it's my privilege that my church, this, uh, I come from a province, I'm from a family, and I came to Manila to study. And we have a small church, but they have a small Bible school. It's a unique Bible school. It's not designed for training people who will become pastors, but many of them become pastors or leaders in the churches. Even if you are a drunkard, if you want to study the Bible, you can attend the Bible school. So at that time, I, it did not come to me. That's crazy, but that's the way it is. So the one who became one of the great leaders, when he joined, he studied the Bible school, he just wanted to study the Bible, he would have the ram here at his back. But the Lord saved him. And in that Bible school, we stayed in the dorm. We ate together, we prayed together, we quarreled together. So one funny thing could happen. In the morning, we are all preparing to go to church and two will be having a debate, one who is a premillennial and a millennial, and they get peace of one another, of each other, and suddenly they will start boxing each other, and they're going to church. That's part of our training. And now looking back, I realize it's like, you know, the disciples. <laughs> when at the early days of their training, that's the way they were. So it's okay. It's part of really transforming our character. And later on, as we mature, we realize how immature we were. And that's part of the training that happened in Jesus Christ, of the training of the twelve. And they were sent to go to, 
It's like, you know, he'll promise to pay you the one-way fare. You come here by faith. And he'll say afterwards, sorry, we did not raise the money. How are you going to go home by faith? That's the kind of training that Jesus Christ did. He sent them two by two. Don't bring your bound and so on. But they learn how to really depend on God. Even if they were so afraid not knowing what to say when they are faced with authorities and that Jesus Christ simply said, the Holy Spirit will give you the message to say. I do not recommend that every Sunday. You must prepare. Now, in all of these things, my whole point is this. We need training that will really form our mind in the mind of Christ. We need theology. We need the development of skills. But if we want to develop healthy pastors, we cannot just give a passing comment that the heart is important also. Because we know that in the scripture, when God looked for the next leader, he that did not look upon those who have good impressions to be a good king. And Jesus looked into the heart. You know, when pangalan tatay ni David, when Jesse paraded his son, he did not even consider David qualified. He did not even you know, think that, David, you also present yourself. And when you read the story of David, some of his brothers have uh, belittled him and did not, you know, they don't, did not like him. And yet, God looked into his heart. He was not perfect. He would not qualify in topic when we examine his character, but his heart is right with God. And so, what I'm trying to say, if we want to develop weak must really learn to integrate part of our training process must be the integration of the development of the heart. And we cannot separate the ito for the heart, ito for the mind, ito for the hands and so on. No, we are a full person. And therefore, I hope that in our training process to develop a healthy pastors, we consider these areas. Personal experience. Our story must be an important element of the curriculum in training. And our story is a story of brokenness. And we have conversations over the table a while ago that we cannot afford not to deal with this issue of the story of our lives. Our experience in the ministry should be part of the story. That's why people say if we are to become good leaders, we have to become reflective practitioners. We need to keep reflecting because I just realized that not everything that I need to know about God can be learned from theology books. Now I am also engaged in really coming alongside with missionaries ministering to the Muslim communities. Our Pastor Ed is here. And we are coming alongside with the Muslim background believers. Many of them are uneducated. But God is real to them. God is real to them. Now, we become educated and we become sophisticated and we doubt the test testimony of their experiences. Uh, recently, I was talking with one of these leaders in the <coughs> Muslim world. He, I think he just reached grade, grade six. But he's very passionate, and just recently, he baptized 12 disciples, 12 new believers. Wow, you know how, he, how he, they baptized? They baptized one another. So he baptized, so the six men or five men, he baptized and the women will also, he baptized one and one will baptize the other. Until, you know, each one is learning how to baptize when they are baptized. Is that possible? No, in that denomination, that is horrible. <laughs> you are not licensed. So we have many protocols. We make it difficult to minister. 
But that's the way they did it. Is it a complete baptism? So he just demonstrated, this is the way I was baptized. I will baptize you in this manner. And they baptized. And I asked him, what happened afterwards? Well, they feel so great. They didn't realize that Isa can still use them just to baptize. They, that was very serious to them. So one time he's going to a village. And he, his companion was asking, we must visit that place. I said, you know, I don't have enough gasoline. No, just go. And so he tried. And of course, they would not reach the village because they don't have enough gallon. And suddenly it stopped. And lo and behold, they stop in a place where there is a gasoline sari-sari store. You know, a gasoline place on the battle of, you know, uh, Coke and Pepsi. And he was able to buy and put more gasoline, add gas, put gasoline in the tank, in the empty tank. And they were able to reach the place. And that was evening. Following day, he went back to the same place. And he was looking for the man selling gasoline. And he could not find. And he asked the people, where's the gasoline store here? There is no gasoline store here. Who sold him the gasoline? Now, these stories are so common <laughs> that you encounter, especially in the villages up on the mountain. People who do not read and write, but people are converted. Churches are being planted because they are simply following the Lord Jesus Christ. I don't know whether it's still true today, but it has been said that graduates of the seminary do not plant church. And I know that in our story here in the Philippines that don't 2,000. Our target was to plant 50,000 churches, 50, uh, a church in every barangay, and we reached more than 51,000 churches. How did this happen? Because when you count the pastors, especially those who were formerly trained, they are not, they cannot do that. And so what happened is that, you know, here is uh, Pastor Angel, a senior pastor, and he said to one of his young people, he said, join me in the Bible study, you know, bring the guitar and the songbook. And they went to the Bible study. Okay, his role is to play the guitar and to lead the singing and to read the passage and so on. And that will be doing for some time. And then, Pastor Angel, next meeting, I'll not be around, do it. And the young people, I could not do it. You do it, you, do, you have seen me, just do it. And he went there, started doing and reading the Bible, and he could not explain it, and people were just so amazed. And we know, we know how many Bible studies turn into church, and many of those who have started it have never been to topic training. The Lord used them. And of course, some, many of them, they realize that they need formal training. And this should be the partnership of non-formal and informal. We start them in the ministry and they realize they need more training. We send them to Bible school. What happens is that we send to Bible schools those who don't have any idea why they were there. But we send people who are really already in the field and they realize they need more equipping. I think we will have better graduates in, from the Bible school. So what I'm trying to say is that we need to really put people into experience. And that's the way Jesus Christ trained. Of course, he was really deepening their theology, conversing to them about the kingdom of God and so on. But healthy, healthy leaders can also be trained not only from their personal experience of God, but our personal example. How oh, we know that? That we are trained because of someone who have journeyed with us and have been an example to us. Now, I realized this, this matter. What is our primary calling as pastors? If you are a pastor, what is your primary calling? Say we grow the church, you know, we have To, to preach and so on, all these functions, the 
functions listed on our job description that is so difficult to do. Now, one thing I realized that my primary calling as a pastor is to lead people to become like Jesus. And the primary instrument to do that would be my own life. We cannot underestimate that. All of us here would testify that there is someone who have demonstrated to us what it means to live the Lord Jesus Christ, even if that person is not perfect, yet that person has been very instrumental. So I'm glad to, to see this morning in the, what Ramesh presented, you start from mobilizing, then you have mentoring, and then monitoring. When we were talking about topic, we also realized that it's mentoring that is critical. Now, in mentoring, we emphasize accountability. But if accountability is going to work, we need to be vulnerable enough to permit people to have accessibility into our lives. Because most of the time, what we demonstrate are only the good side. But they need to see the reality of our own struggle. They will be permitted to see us, to watch us when we are struggling, when we get angry, and so on. But we are so good in covering up and putting a mask that they only see our pretensions rather than the reality. So part of the thing that we need to be doing really is, when I talk about accountability, is peer engagement of life-on-life -life mentoring. I hope that all of us have mentors. Uh, well, kasama na rin yung tormentos, but you know, we want mentors. And the first thing that we need to learn is to be mentored. And many have seen that the reason many disciples today and many leaders today are not discipling simply because they have not been discipled. Because we don't see, at least now we are seeing this tradition, the tradition of intentional discipleship is not part of the legacy of the church. It was coming from the campus ministry and the youth ministry. Because in the youth ministry and the campus ministry, the relationship is more informal. So you have fun together and you live together, you laugh, you talk about your issues, you talk about your love life, you talk about your sex life, everything under the sun, you talk about it. And later on, one of those who had been in this group with me, and he was looking back 30 years thereafter, he said, the only thing I could remember, I did not remember the exposition of Kukui Herman. I remember what we talked about in their house. And that was the thing that really shaped them. The perspective at looking at all areas of life from the perspective of the kingdom happening in conversation in this engagement of peer-to-peer -peer mentoring. And lastly, part of the thing that form part of developing healthy pastor is coming to terms with our own pains in life. I have already mentioned that. One time there is a denominational leader who was asked to step down from his ministry, from his leadership position. Because the trail of blood in his ministry was there. Many lambs will, limbs were littering because he was so destructive and violent in the way he dealt with his own people. And then he was asked to go into counseling and he was reflecting experience. And this is what he said, and I could not forget it. Now I realized, he said, that the reason I am hurting others is because I am hurting hurting myself. Now, if that pain is not healed, not only that we become dysfunctional in our life. Now, remember that I said that our life is our major instrument for leadership in guiding people to Christ. If we are living dysfunctional lives, 
Yes, we know how to preach well, but somehow we are not exhibiting the humility of Christ. There is a problem there. And so we need, we cannot live well, we cannot really live the way of Christ if there is no healing in our own inner lives. So I hope that we can include people in the ministry like those involved in inner healing, in ancient path, no? And, and I went to seminary and I did not e experience that kind of ministry. But this is very important and very critical. Not only that we become dysfunctional if we are not healed, the dark side of our life will emerge, especially when we are already in position of leadership, if our inner hurt are not healed. So what my, my, my plea this evening is that let's coordinate, let's collaborate, and if we can, let us integrate not just the training of the head, not just the training of the, the, the hands and the skills, but the training of the heart as part of the integrated person that we need to train. And this we cannot hurry. This will take time and so on. Topic, uh, when we started Core 300, anong year yun, Philip? 2005. And this is now 2018. So we are still in that. No, it's not yet uh, finished. So it's a long process. And those of you who have been there, it's a long process. And we need to really coordinate. We cannot say that now you have the certificate, you are done. No, we have to continue on. So one new ministry that PCEC has invited is Asian Access. Asian Access is a very simple, it attempts, it attempts to really do training in the way like Jesus Christ trained. So they will invite 12 to 16, 18 people and journey for that period of two years. They meet four times a year. So we, try, we, we discuss simple things, things that we already know, loving relationship with God, discipleship, intentional discipleship, and how we can plant churches, these simple things. Actually, those who would come, I know that already. And if you are a trainer, I have my module on that. But that's not the issue. It's not the content that is important. We attend the training to process, and we begin to reflect ourselves, and we realize, yes, we know it here, but it's not yet here. And so we build a community, and in between the training, we have mentoring groups. So right now, we have three, three groups, and we'll be finishing uh, by February. So a small process of journeying and not after two years it doesn't mean to say graduate, tapos na. No, we will continue on to journey together while we are training others. It's a slow process, but somehow in this simple, it's really humbling experience. A very humbling experience and importance of relationship in this part of training. Now, this can be done even in a formal training. As I as was telling, that one of my previous, uh, precious memory in studying in that small Bible school in our church, it's not only the practical training, the practical lessons given to us by the missionaries, but living together in a dorm, we eat together, we cook together, we laugh together, we have devotions together. Sometimes the Holy Spirit visited us that up to 4 o'clock in the morning, we are still praying. Now, those are memories that only happen when there are no pastor. We're just together there. Those are learning. But nowadays, tinada na lang natin sa internet. So, pa Facebook, Facebook na lang. So that face to face engagement is minimized. Because we thought if we can give them the right reading and the right information, they are trained we have only given a portion. And maybe the most important aspect is not yet there, and that is the formation of the heart. So I hope that all of us will agree and accept that not only to put this in our training, but we need this as well. It's only when we become vulnerable and we acknowledge that we never graduate from this, 
is a continuing thing. So that Paul at the point when he was about to die, he still said, I am the chief of all sinners. He was about, you know, he was imprisoned. He felt his loneliness. Bring with me, bring with you Mark. I needed him. So kulang pa rin sa pansin. No? Ayun pa rin yung need mo for fellowship, for friendship. We all need this. And it's only when we learn that we, it is important that we have to give value to experience experience with God and experience with one another learning from those who have been ahead of us learning in the context of community of peer to peer mentoring and most of all to find healing in the pains that is so buried deep in our hearts that make us dysfunctional unless we are healed we will never be holy and let's pray almighty God continue to help us and guide us, we confess our own brokenness and vulnerability. Lord, we know we need one another. Thank you very much for all, for all of us here that we can collaborate and we can coordinate so that we can support one another because no one among us could say, I have the right manual, I have the right curriculum, and this is what is needed. No, we don't say that, Lord. We need one another. Some have been gifted to teach theology. Some have been gifted as mentors. Some have been gifted as coaches. Lord, we need one another so that we can develop healthy leaders for the Philippine Church. In Jesus' name.